This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guests today are Sean Kelly, who is professor of philosophy at Harvard University, and Hubert Dreyfus, who is professor of philosophy at UC Berkeley. Their new book is All Things Shining, Reading the Western Classics to Find Meaning in a Secular Age. Gentlemen, welcome to our program. Thanks for having me. Uh, what are the circumstances that led you to write this book? Well, it started with me a while back, I guess maybe 10 or 15 years, that I wanted to give an introductory course where students would, beginning students would understand why it was important and interesting to do philosophy. But instead of using philosophy books, I decided to use the great books in, of literature, that books that focus the understanding of what it is to be human and what it is to be for some for epochs. And that's how I got into it. Then I gave what my philosophy six, which is a bunch of famous books, Homer and Aeschylus, uh, Virgil, Dante, and, and our hero, uh, Melville, Moby Dick. And that's that's the background. Sean comes in at the, on the story as, the, as my starting out as teaching assistant and P, my PhD and added a whole frame to the, my list of important great books. Uh, so we should hear his frame. But yeah, it was probably more than 10 or 15 years ago. Really? I graduated 10. 15 years ago. Oh, okay. So yeah, 15 or 20 years ago. and. Uh, and what struck me when I heard Bert talk about these great works was how much the things that he was saying affected the students and affected me. And it seemed to me that this was more than just a story about how things used to be in other epochs in the history of the West, but it seemed to be a story that affected people now in a very personal way. So I struggled. When I started teaching a version, uh, this ver a version of this course, I struggled to figure out how you could frame it so that it would make explicit that what you were trying to do when you were reading these books was somehow to figure out what was still relevant in them for, for us nowadays. And that's um, the kind of frame that we ended up giving to the book. And as we talk about the goal of the book, uh, you, you write, our goal is to recognize and bring back to life those practices that su can sustain a sense of the sacred in our secular age. W what do you mean by sacred? Ah, well, we say different things at different times. We were just talking about this yesterday. One of the things that we mean by sacred is we, we borrow a phrase from Nietzsche. Nietzsche said, that the sacred, we, we, we discovered we actually said it a little bit wrong in the book. Nietzsche said something like, the sacred is whatever it is in a culture at which you're not allowed to laugh. In the book we said at which you can't laugh, and that's sort of misleading, but at which the society doesn't allow you to laugh. And uh, it looks like in epochs, uh, previous epochs in the history of the West, there was always some range of stuff at which the culture wouldn't allow you to laugh. It was so serious and so important and so taken for granted by the culture that it grounded everything and you couldn't really look at it and distance yourself from it. Uh, but in our culture, it looks as though, arguably at any rate, there's almost nothing at which you're not allowed to laugh. Uh, and so that's one of the things that we mean when we say this is a secular age in which there's no notion of the sacred. And, and uh, I get the sense that both of you in part were influenced by the students you work with in the sense of, well, 
they asked themselves questions about, well, what should I do with my life? Should I choose this? Should I choose that? And, and my sense is that your notion of the sacred is about also what is a meaningful choice in the context of my life, say as a student, or someone trying to make a, a decision. I guess this is for me or for you? Yeah, I think it's for you. Is okay, I thought you were gonna say that's that. That's part of the frame. Yeah, that's part of the frame. So I think it's true. I mean, one of the things you wanna do when you teach a course, and sometimes you manage to succeed and sometimes you don't, is to um, teach it in such a way that the material is really gonna to speak to the students. So one of the things you're doing when you teach a course is you're listening to try to figure out what sparks the student's interests uh, from among the things you're saying and, and what doesn't. And one of the things, it occurred to me, consistently struck my interest when I was a student and Bert was saying things or my students' interest and I was saying things had to do with the idea that somehow um, we find ourselves, we contemporary folks, find ourselves confronted with choices consistently, all sorts of choices. Our students in particular find themselves confronted with lots of life choices, but everyone does. Uh, and that we, we consistently try to find a way of understanding on the basis of what we're supposed to be making these choices. And it looks like one of the ways of understanding uh, the dilemma of our contemporary age is that it's no longer obvious on the basis of what you're supposed to make these life choices. That might distinguish our age from earlier epochs in the history of the West where it was more or less clear on the basis of what you were supposed to be making choices about your life. And so we tried to, so I, I tried to frame the course so that it would look as though it was at least potentially offering the students a way to read these texts so that they could find answers to that kind of question. And, and where we are today in the secular age, and we'll in a little while talk about how this came about, but, but the dilemma for people trying to decide to find a meaningful course uh, for their life with some reference to, to the community's values, that, that we're in a state where there seems to be nothing. You, you really call it the age of nihilism. Yeah, I, I think I'll just take this one. And you want yeah. to add to it, or no? No, the, the, this is all the important frame. That's in right. Which, which Sean put a, around yeah. my we'll five get back to books. <laughs> well, okay, yeah. all right. I'll keep right. going. We, we right. will not let Harvard <laughs> dominate this stage. Yeah. I, I mean, I think right. The the secular age is is not actually our term. That's a term we borrow from other philosophers. Charles Taylor is a philosopher who's a friend of ours and, and we think has got important things to say about this in his book called A Secular Age. But what, what Charles Taylor says is that our age is a secular age uh, in the following sense. It's a secular age in the sense that uh, uh, even for people who are religious believers in our age, of whom there are many, and certainly in the United States there are many religious believers, uh, religion doesn't play the role in their lives that it used to play in earlier epochs in the history of the West. And the reason it seems not to play the role in their lives is that the role religion used to play was giving you a certain ground on the basis of which you understood how you were supposed to make decisions about your life. But it could only do that if it was the kind of thing that you weren't really allowed by the culture to distance yourself from. And that used to be true, say, in the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, uh, it used to be true that if you came across someone who didn't share the dominant religious beliefs of the culture, which presumably if you were in the dominant, in the majority, were your religious beliefs, if you came across someone who didn't share those beliefs, then the fact that they didn't share those beliefs made it justifiable for you to consider them less than human just in virtue of the fact that they didn't share your religious beliefs. But in our culture, that doesn't seem to be a justifiable move anymore. It seems like the society insists that it has to be possible when you come across someone who doesn't share your religious beliefs, that they might nevertheless be living an admirable life, a life that you could admire, a life that you could maybe even consider yourself aspiring to. And if they can do that without sharing your religious beliefs, 
then it can't be your religious beliefs that determine for certain what the right way is to go on. So even for people who have traditional kinds of religious beliefs in our age, those beliefs don't play the same kind of grounding role in the culture that they used to. And the danger, the threat, is that um, what will happen in the culture then is that you won't have any way of understanding what's more important than anything else when you're making decisions about how to go on. And that state where nothing seems any more important than anything else is the state that Nietzsche called the state of nihilism, the state that Auden, W.H. Auden said in a, in a poem, uh, the state where all elsewheres are equal, the state where every choice is equally good. And that's a pretty, Nietzsche thought that was a great thing, but I think we think that's an unlivable state to find yourself in. Uh, and so the threat of nihilism is a threat that's peculiar to the secular age. Now, now, the third uh, goal, uh, we, I'm trying to walk you through your goals. We, uh, these were embedded in the middle of the book, I yeah. found. But you, you say, y you want to ask, is there anything in these self-understandings of particular errors from our history that we can use to combat the nihilism of our sacred age? So, so you're, you're trying to construct an answer to this dilemma uh, that we've just described? I think it's uh, uh, something like that, although I'm not sure I would say construct an answer. I would say something like we're trying to open people up and make them sensitive to things that people in earlier epochs were automatically sensitive to because of the way their cultures were organized and because of their self-understanding and their understanding of the world. We're trying to make them sensitive to those things that people were earlier sensitive to that we've sort of lost our sense of. And the reason to do that uh, is that in these earlier epochs, they weren't confronted with the particular challenge that we are confronted with. So the natural question when you're reading these great works of art from the earlier epochs is, is there anything in them that I could appropriate for myself or that our culture could appropriate for ourselves that would allow us to resist this peculiar threat that they sort of automatically resisted, but that, we're, that we find ourselves confronted with? So, so this is really an important argument for what you do. That is the extent to which in, in your courses you, you actually go back and look at the, the various epics and, and what were the important ideas. That's right. And I, I think Bert was doing it sort of automatically. He sort of somehow had this sui generis sense that these texts were the important ones and that you really needed to be delving into them and understanding what they were about and seeing what understanding of being they, they gathered together and focused. Uh, and, uh, and I, what I saw was that it was affecting students in this amazingly personal and, and interesting way. So my question was something like, why does it do that? What is it about our culture that allows the kinds of things that Bert's already doing to affect students in the way that it, that it does? Now, as, as I walk you through your book, I, I want to comment that it's a, it's a beautifully written book. So it, it's really a great book for the, the general audience, but I want you to explicate one, one thing that you say here. You say, this is a phenomenological rather than humanist or Hegelian reading of the history of the West. It focuses on the way people experience themselves in the sacred. Explain that. Me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Well, but, but, uh, but again, that's still so much not my way of thinking about okay. it. But I can sort of, and, and that's what Sean wrote that. Sean wrote it all. He put the framework around it. But just while I'm talking, what, what I was focusing on was look at these, th this amazing fact. There are these various ways of understanding what it is to be a human being, what it is to be a thing, what it is to have a history and all that. Uh, with, I came from a little town in Indiana where they didn't have any understanding of any of this, never heard of Dostoevsky <laughs> and Dante and so forth. And when I was an undergraduate reading these books for the first time, I thought that was one of the most exciting things in the world, that there was what now I would call, because I see that 
other people, Heidegger particularly, has called it that, is the hidden history of the West. That is, that there has been a series of epochs in the history of the West which gave us whole different understandings of what it is to be. And I thought that was just so interesting. It never occurred to me that it was going to help me with my nihilism because I never really occurred to me that I was suffering from nihilism. But I can see now why, when I listen to Sean, students come up to me in the supermarket and so forth and say, you've changed my life. And they get, I get email maybe once a week telling me that I've changed somebody's life with the podcasts. And that's because that's where the frame comes in. They, <clears throat> they do need to not just, they, what are they going to do with these other epochs? That's the next question. And again, I didn't have any plan in mind, but what, they, what I see now, partly through Sean's way of seeing it, is they will see in these other epochs things that were central once and are marginal now, but they're still there around in our epoch. The, great athletic events, the, the music, the, the dinner parties. They were already in Homer 2,000 years ago. Is that the right number? Almost 3,000. Almost 3,000 years ago. <coughs> and uh, we maybe can still get the kind of excitement and meaning and insight and intensity out that they had in the center of their lives. We can find it in the margin of ours, thanks to these great works. And then, and that's a whole other story, which I don't know how to do, but they will have to learn to do, develop the skills for bringing back these marginal practices and putting them in the center of their lives so that they again have uh, what the earlier people thought of as their gods. They, they will find their own new gods, which won't be some gods that they invent and they won't be totally new. They will find the sacred and the gods that were there in these other epochs in an intense way and bring them back in a new way. That's why we end up with Moby Dick. The only person who sees this is Melville, who says explicitly that he wants to bring back the Homeric gods. And, uh, and he is, in the course of Moby Dick, collecting the sacred wherever he finds it from all these other cultures. Instead of the other epochs in the history of the West, by the time you get to Melville, it's the whole West is, I mean, the whole world is there available. So he sails all around the world, picking up the cultural uh, uh, sacred, the, the meaningful, the, the intense and so forth, where, and, and getting in sync with it wherever he finds it and bringing it back. Now that I say it, I don't see exactly how that fits with the Homer. It's, uh, he, now that we have to think about this. I mean, there seem, to be, there seem to be two different stories, both of them right, that you go back and he, Melville wants to go back to the Homeric gods, but he also wants to get in touch with all the other gods and sacred that he can find. And that's not incompatible. That's right. That's just two wonderful sources of meaning and intensity <coughs> and insight. And he's f for both of them. Uh, and my course seems to be giving people access to both of them. And so they get all excited. So what is the theme that connects uh, the world of Homer with the world of, of Melville? They, they, they seem to be so disparate. Yeah, uh, that's right, because Melville is the puzzle. He, there he is in Moby Dick doing two things, collecting the sacred and, the, and worshiping all the, little, all the gods, even the little wooden god Yo-Yo of, of, of Queequeg, his friend. He's ready to do the fasting and do the practices for all of them. That's one thing. And then there's this <coughs> claim that I was just citing that we should get back the Homeric gods and, uh, and, and put Zeus at the head of it all. That, that's what he says in Moby Dick. What's the connection between all these different references to the gods and the sacred, it, the positive references? Well, they're just the opposite of what you'd expect. They're all the cases of non-monotheism. Monotheism is the enemy of the multiple <coughs> local sacred. And so where, and wherever he, Melville or me, can collect the, the sacred and, and the gods as a plurality of possible meaningful experiences, I do it. And whenever I can criticize any kind of 
autonomous, uh, independent, fundamental, complete. These are all bad things from Melville's and from our, our point of view. We, we, we question them. The, the bottom line is, I never bothered to mention this course, which is about we keep talking, is called From Gods to God and Back. It's how we had the Homeric gods. We lost them one by one and step by step, in effect, until we got to the super thing with Dante, where there was one god and it was all created by him and for him and so forth. And then we started on the way back to Homer. Uh, I want to sort of un unwrap the complexity here and, and what, what you're really doing in the book to see where we are, where we've arrived, uh, is to, to look at these different epochs and essentially define the paradigm that allows people in that age to find the sacred. And in, in a, you, you really start with Homer, and I think you, you really end with Melville, as, as you, were, you were just discussing. Now, let me, let's explore this a little. Uh, you are nostalgic for the Homeric world. Is that fair? Oh, good. It, it is not fair. No. Or we don't want to return to the Homeric world. Right. Right. So, but, but you, you well, let, then let's say it this way. Then you see in that world important insight into the nature of the problem and into the solution as adapted to us. Not so we can't go back to worshiping Apollo and Athena and getting messages from them, but what they, what they stand for, what they bring to us, what they, what they manifested, we can get back in touch with that and bring it into our world in a way that uh, connects it with uh, things that are still on the margin of our concerns. Is there something I'm leaving out of that? Yeah. Well, I was going to I was going to try a slightly different way of saying it. Uh, I mean, one of the reasons it wouldn't be right to say that we're nostalgic for the Homeric world is that there's a lot of stuff that you just wouldn't want from the Homeric world, and I think it's really true that there are lots of ways in which uh, our understanding of ourselves has got things that it's better to have or more appropriate to have for us than, than Homer's understanding. For instance, uh, as Bert said, it's not part of the proposal that we should go around believing that Athena and Zeus and Ares are sort of causal, ultimate causal agents of the universe or, or anything like that. The view that we have is supposed to be completely consistent with everything we understand about the physical nature of the universe, and in particular not to posit extra causal entities. But what we think that they're sensitive to, that we've lost a sensitivity to, is a certain way of understanding ourselves that uh, that recognizes that a lot of the time when we're at our best and when we're being the kind of being that it seems appropriate for us to aspire to be, the way we're acting isn't fully under our control. It doesn't feel that way. When we're, and, and this happens, you know, uh, there are tons of examples of it, but, you know, great athletes often say in the moment when they're when they're doing something great that it didn't feel as though they were the, the source of their activity. It felt as though it was just happening through them or for them or something like that. And we want to we wanna emphasize that experience as an experience that's genuinely worth getting back in touch with. And also we want to emphasize the fact that when you are sensitive to that as a moment of greatness in your life, it feels automatically as if there's a kind of mood that's required after the fact, which is the mood of gratitude, the mood of being grateful that this wonderful thing has occurred through you or for you or something like that. Now, in Homer's world, that gratitude was typically, I take it, directed towards an entity, the being Athena or the being Zeus or Ares or something like that. We want to resist that idea. Um, but nevertheless, it seems appropriate to us to try to cultivate in ourselves the sense of gratitude that the Homeric Greeks found so natural. So that in that epoch, a student might find a, a, a sense of the sacred and all of its elements, even though in, the, in, in, in these works, 
they are relating to gods that are meaningless to us. So, so this is part of what you're trying to do throughout the book. Let's look at this epic. What, what really got these people going uh, as they related to the sacred? And what, by understanding that, what does it, how can we relate it to today? That's what you're trying to do. That's right, yeah, and, and in particular ask, what aspects of that can we still appropriate in, in our world? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, if, if in, in, in understanding these epics, you use the term the reconfigurers, central figures in their time who, who come along and, and you, uh, you, uh, you identify two, as one being Jesus and the other Descartes, and you say, these individuals, these extraordinary individuals come along and they are unable to remain embedded in the epic they're in. They no longer can uh, accept all the terms of the sacred of that epic. What do they then do in response to that? They, they, I'm, I'm wondering though, a, a loose end that was shown with so much setting up. How would you like an example of, the, of a case where the Greek god, namely Aphrodite, shows up in a way sure, that's, not meta, that's not metaphysical yeah. and the, out of which we can still learn something and so forth? Because that's how I got hooked on this 15 years ago. Right. It was, was, I was always sort of reading the margins and between the lines. And early on in the Odyssey, something very peculiar happens. Helen comes back from 10 or 15 years away in Troy uh, with, with Paris. <coughs> and she's giving a big banquet for uh, Telemachus, Odysseus' son, who's visiting. That's not important. What's important is all the, all the aristocrats are there and Menelaus is there and Helen is telling the story about how she ran off with Paris to Troy. Mm -hmm. And that's already pretty strange. You have to fill in, Menelaus was her first husband. Yes, Menelaus was her she first left husband. and then came back to Exactly, him. yes. And uh, it, so how, how can we understand this strange behavior? Well, first thought is, well, she's put drugs in their drinks, which she had uh, from uh, opium and from Egypt, so that they could hear about the Trojan War without breaking down in tears for all their dead friends. So there they were now, but then she tells this story and Menel what does Menelaus do? He says, an excellent tale, my dear, and very becoming. Mm -hmm. And now that is really weird. She's just said that she ran off, leaving behind their, <coughs> their newborn infant from her husband, and he's congratulating her. And it could be, of course, the, too much opium, but it isn't, because at the end of that book of the Odyssey, uh, Homer says, when, when Menelaus went to bed that night, beside him lay Helen, of the long robes, peerless among women. So she, Helen is the greatest. She's also a daughter of Zeus. Uh, uh, and so how, how do we understand a culture in which she's the star? Well, then you have to see that wh what has she got that we can understand, though we have trouble, would have trouble sharing it. And that is an openness to the gods. To begin with, we got to say a parenthetical, the gods are not these figures, that's not important. The gods are like moods. Uh, they're the attuning ones, according to how we read it. And here is Aphrodite attuning Helen to the, ap the uh, erotic attractiveness of this situation when Paris, this very handsome stranger, comes to spend the night at their house. And at that point, uh, Helen says, uh, she ran off because Aphrodite sh sh shined on the, shone on the scene. What does that mean? That means that, that every Ag Ag Aphrodite made it, uh, when Aphrodite is around, the situation becomes only what is erotic matters not good old stodgy Menelaus and their new baby, but Paris, the handsome guy. And so she is drawn to go off with him. And then she leads for a while an intense and uh, new, exciting uh, life in Troy. And what are we supposed to get out of that? Well, not that you should run off with your uh, with a guest, with your house guests and have an exciting life, not, but that you should be open to the possibilities in a situation and that they are sometimes risky 
and, but they are also often exciting and, and, and uh, satisfying and meaningful, and that's it. Uh, that, so that's what you get. You get the idea that the right relation to the divine is openness and receptivity, and even if it's risky, you do it, and that's what Helen did, and that's what we can learn to do. And then that's another long story, how we would learn to do it. Right. I won't say that now. So, so, so what, what you've just given us is an example of how you, you take these works and extract from them some piece of the essence that we, we need to keep in the back of our mind if we're going to try to work through our present uh, dilemma. Now, we were, we were talking about uh, uh, Melville a moment ago, and in Melville, what you were, you were ultimately saying, I think, in the chapter is that that Ahab goes out trying to find the answer, the new definition of, of, of the sacred. And, and, and in the end, he, he finds that there's nothing, basically. And so in, in that case, he is more of a modern man. Really, he really relates to our dilemma. And, and, and so, so hence, again, one can take each one of these and see what the puzzle is, place that in the context of the time, and then, and then move on uh, to the present. Now, I do want to go back to this thing about reconfigurers. One more, quick, one more thing, because they're, again, yeah. one step away. And what did, what was, why are we looking at Ahab? Because he was willful. And what did we learn in the, in, from Helen? That openness and receptivity is the highest way to relate to the gods. So bottom line, Ahab is not receptive. Kantians who are all for autonomy are not receptive. Beware of receptivity. <coughs> no, not no. beware of re receptivity. Yeah. Open oh, yourself sorry. up to it. I, I misspoke. <laughs> the openness, to re beware of people who so, are Kantians. So we, we've got to watch the time here. So what, what, but, but what, what your, the, the other little piece of this, and we don't need to go into a le lengthy explanation, is that key, in this narrative that you're telling, which how we wound up where we are now, is the notion of the, 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 the emergence of reconfigurers dissatisfied with their time, who, uh, who essentially construct uh, a new way of, of viewing the world. Without going into detail, Jesus is an example, Descartes. And I think why that is important is what you're saying is, as we deal with the dilemma of our time, in a way, we have to become reconfigurers, basically. Well, is that open at least to, re to a yeah, reconfigure. Yeah, to re yeah to, right. But, but in our individual life, uh, we, that, that, that's a good lesson for us. We're not going to necessarily reconstruct the, the, the ethos of our time, but, but we, we have to take the autonomy of our time and work with it. To, to come up with uh, some personal notion of the sacred. We have to take what's the, the, the non-autonomy of our time, where the, 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 the little cracks in which receptivity of, of, of the erotic sort, but also of the sports sort, where all these receptivities come out, we have to take them and work with them. We have to develop the skill to bring them out and make our life meaningful by way of them. That's right. And the reconfigurer is that same thing writ large, where something in the margins of the whole culture. You're absolutely right. No other reviewer, nobody else who discusses it, ever paid <coughs> any attention to the reconfigurers. But there, what each of these texts is, a work of art, a, w a work of art is a reconfigurer. Well, uh, Homer changed his world, and then Dante changed his world, and then so forth. Anyway, and that's a very important to see how that's done, which is by Jesus and by, in, in a lesser way, as you say, by a, an individual who wants to reconfigure their, their world. Uh, Jesus does it by putting down the, the law, which was the big deal thing, and substituting this new thing, agape love, which is this, op again, open, uh, uh, w w uh, receptive and uh, way of relating to others and so forth, and 
transforms things because th what was the central thing, namely the law, is now still there but only on the margin. And what was the marginal thing or, and, and not to be indulged in was, uh, say, the all kinds of um, non-legal, more receptive and mood-like things. And those those were on the margin and, and generally not good, like adultery and uh, uh, coveting and so forth. But Jesus takes this marginal stuff, but not not, not adultery and coveting, but the non but something else, a kind of love that is not in in the law, and makes it central, and changes everything. Mm -hmm. uh, now, now, when you look at the modern era, the the, the example you look at to help us understand where we are, and then we will then talk about where you see possibilities for the present era, is David Foster Wallace, ah, that's uh, a his. contemporary <laughs> writer. So, so what I want you to explain to our audience is how he provides a window into understanding the really dark side of our situation on the one hand, but also a, a possibility for seeing a way out. One of the things that I think is really interesting about Wallace, who, uh, who committed suicide two years ago, uh, is that he, he, his conception of what you could be up to as a writer is a conception that really spoke, speaks to me and I think speaks to Bird. I mean, it's a conception that we think great writers in the past have had. It's the conception of drawing together in your work a total understanding of what the world is about and what the understanding of ourselves could be such that we could, uh, we could live lives that are worth aspiring to uh, in our world. Now, uh, to do that, you have to be very sensitive to the nature of the world that you live in. You have to be a great observer of the world. And I think he was a great observer of the world. Uh, but it's a very difficult task in that context to think up all on your own a way to respond to the threat of nihilism that I think he, that I think he identifies as the central th threat of the age. And so what we try to argue in the chapter on Wallace is that he was incredibly sensitive to this threat, that you can see it all throughout his writings, that he sees it as a central threat to the, you know, to the modern person, uh, and that he's trying to develop in his characters ways of responding to this threat that are ultimately going to be in some way or another livable and that people themselves could aspire to. Uh, and what we argue is that at least in one of the threads that you find running through his work, there are no doubt many others, but at least in one of the threads that you see running through his work, um, the response that he proposes is itself essentially an unlivable response. What he says uh, is that it's true that situations present themselves to you in such a way that, uh, you know, you get really angry or really unhappy or they seem meaningless or, or whatever. They seem painful. They seem awful. They seem like they're threatening to you in one way or another. But the right response to that is just to recognize that situations have whatever meaning you, may, you give to them, and you can just throw some other meaning onto them. And we think that that's really not a livable solution. That is the solution that Nietzsche thought we could have. It's the solution that Melville explores in a character he calls Bulkington, who ultimately uh, commits suicide also, or at, at any rate dies in the ocean. And, uh, and Melville says about Bulkington that he's a demigod, that he, to the extent that he was able to do this, to live in the infinite and give meaning of you know, his own sort to anything, uh, he, he was a demigod. And I think that's what you would have to be in order to live the life that Wallace seems to be proposing. And uh, so th that's why he's a, such a fascinating case. And, and uh, you quote from Wallace in a Kenyan commencement address mm. 
and uh, it's sort of an add-on to what you just said, and he talks about learning how to think really means learning how to exercise some control over how and what you think. It means being conscious and aware enough to choose what you pay attention to and to choose how you construct meaning from experience. Because if you cannot exercise this kind of choice in adult life, you will be totally hosed. Right. So, so in a way, so what, what we, we, it, this is fascinating, and, and I should say to our audience, they really need to read the book <laughs> because you, you know, the, the clarity there, uh, you, we just can't cover it in an hour of conversation. But, but where we are is we, we've gone back and looked at some examples where one gets an inkling of an element that might be useful for our times. You, you've helped us understand the, 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 the present situation we're in where we can't find the sacred, a, a sacred that helps us choose our meaning. So, so then the, the next step in your work is really to say, well, let's look around where we are today and, and what do we see about where there are some examples of the sacred, and it's a it's a a strange group of of uh, of uh, places you look. One is a hero in the su in a subway. The other is a a, a, a famous basketball player, uh, and the third is is a craftsman. And so, what what is it? Let, let's talk about each of those in turn. But but what is it that we can now? Look at those situations based upon the, uh, this travel through the past to, to help us understand the present. I think what we're interested in in all three of those cases is the moments in a person's life when they're acting at their best, uh, they're doing something that everyone can recognize as extraordinary, as admirable, as worthy of aspiring to in some way or another. And to look in particular at the way, at what it feels like to be in those moments. And what we want to draw out of each of these kinds of cases is the idea that when you're in those moments, it really feels as though the activity is being drawn out of you rather than your being the source of the activity. So the subway hero, Wesley Autry, a guy who who jumped onto the subway tracks in order to save someone who'd fallen there at the very moment that the train was coming into the station. And he, he did it, though he had his two young daughters with him on the... And, and it was an extraordinary act. And people asked him afterwards, what were you thinking? What did you do? And he, and he said over and over again, he said, I wasn't thinking anything. I didn't decide to do anything. It, just, it was just obvious that this had to be done. And that feeling of it's being just obvious that this ha needs to be done at this moment is a feeling that um, people can have if they have the right kind of background, the right kind of skills, and the right kind of openness to what's meaningful in the situation. But the idea that those are the things that you need to develop, a set of background skills that allow you to be open to what's required in the situation, it's just exactly the opposite of Wallace's idea that you need to develop a sense of control over how you de determine and decide all on your own what's going to be meaningful, regardless of what the situation tells you. It's a, so Bert keeps saying it, and I think it's the thing to emphasize. We're trying to pull out of all, each of these previous epics a notion, a different notion in each of them, of a kind of receptivity to what's already meaningful in the situation that we seem no longer to be sensitive to in virtue of the fact that we think meanings in situations come from our own autonomous and subjective choices and from the force of our own individual will. So, so what we have here is a, is a range of possibilities. So the, the Mr. Autry did not train to be a hero. No. It, it's a spur of the moment decision where he is overwhelmed by the situation and he's, he's almost not there because the, the situation defines what he's doing. 
Bradley, the, the senator who was probably the greatest basketball player of his time in college basketball, was a person who operated on the field in a similar way, but, but is a step beyond that because clearly he trained, so there was a skill involved, but once he had that skill, what would happen on the court? So in the court, I mean, it's true that Wesley Autry didn't train for that moment, although it's worth saying, I think, that he had a, a sort of military background. He had a lot of skills that allowed him to deal with risky and dangerous situations in which people might be in, in difficulty and so on. Uh, but right, but Bradley's operating in a, in a narrower domain where he trained like the devil. I mean, he was famous for his work ethic. He worked over and over and over again. But, and what he says about his performance is that, uh, is that um, uh, this, the same kind of thing. He, he experiences himself when he's performing at his best on the basketball court as having his activity drawn out of him, as not deciding or determining what the thing is to do, but being open to what the situation at this moment demands, which is something that someone without his skills couldn't have recognized. And, and finally, what you talk about is the craftsman. And it, it, as we move along the spectrum of possibilities, what, what I think you're saying is that here the emphasis is on the craft, which creates a niche in which you're having been trained and practiced the craft, uh, elevates your sensitivity and control to the situation, you, you lose yourself in a sacred sort of way. That's, well, that's exactly right, that we, we look at this amazing 19th century uh, writer, George Sturt, who's been noticed by other people, but not so much, uh, who was a wheelwright. He ran a wheelwright shop, and he talks about the craft of being a wheelwright. And what he says is that in virtue of the fact that he's got these skills for working with wood, and the people who work in his shop have these skills for working with wood, they can recognize distinctions of worth in the environment that are genuinely there that people without his skills can't see. He says, I can recognize just by looking uh, that you know this piece of ash is doty, or that this piece of ash is tough as whipcord. And he uses these amazing 19th century sort of craftsmanly phrases. And I can tell that just by seeing, because my hands have had in them, built into them, the skill of sawing by hand through this wood and knowing how these different kinds of wood react to the saw under the hand. And, so and when you can recognize, those are genuine distinctions of worth. You know, one piece of wood is just better for something than another piece of wood. And he says that when you lose the skills for working with the wood in this really close way, uh, when you lose the skills because you've got technology that doesn't need to recognize the difference between a, where, a, where a knot in a piece of wood is and where it isn't because the technology can just rip right through the knot anyway. When you lose this, then you lose the skills for recognizing these genuine distinctions of worth. And, but when you've got a sense for these distinctions of worth, it brings about in you a sense that each piece of wood has a kind of personality, a kind of character, a kind of individuality. And when you recognize that, then you, recognize, you develop in yourself a sense of, he says, reverence for the place that it comes from. And that's, that reverence, I think, is a notion of the sacred that he claims, Sturt claims, 19th century craftsmen had for the place in which they lived that as a result of the development of technology we no longer have. But this sense of reverence I think is something that you, that you really can get. I think great musicians have a sense of reverence for the music. Uh, great athletes have a sense of reverence for the sport. And that's why you sometimes see uh, people, athletes, professional athletes reacting in very funny ways when people do something that uh, sort of as, as sort of according to the internal demands of the sport seems inappropriate, where from outside the sport it doesn't seem so inappropriate. Now, in, in your discussion of the sacred, you emphasize it, it's kind of uh, within the community, that, that there's a community recognition. Yeah. And I think what, am I right in saying that where you're winding up 
is more in niches that the individual finds him, himself in through a craft, through training as a surgeon and so on, and that there is the experience we're looking for of the sacred in that niche. Now, the, the place, interestingly enough, where you find this phenomenon, which I believe you call whooshing, <coughs> that, that, that the, the, a communal sense of reaction is uh, in which there is a, a feeling of the sacred, is at athletic events. Uh, and is that, that is that fair? That, that's fair, although uh, people have made more of this, I think, than, than, than one wants to make of it. What we, th what we do think is that spectators, so we've talked about great athletes who've got lots of skill and so on. They can really recognize what needs to be done in a certain situation in a way that others can't, and they have the skill to do it. But spectators, too, uh, can um, have this experience of being receptive to what, um, to what's demanded in a certain situation. Now, we, what we think is that this is a very, um, a, in a certain way, a kind of minor form of the, of the sacred, but it's the form that we have left, I think, a lot of us. It's the one that requires almost no skill whatsoever. It's a form of the sacred because in these moments, you recognize some activity being drawn out of you that you haven't, through your own sense of control or choice, determined is going to happen. It's when a great event occurs and everyone rises as one and, uh, you know, in applause for the event. But you, don't, you hardly have to know the, the sport at all. You could bring your young child there and they'll get excited in the moment. They'll recognize it. But th this notion that in that moment you experience an activity being drawn out of you that doesn't have you as its autonomous and subjective source, that's the thing that we want to focus on. Of course, it's also a dangerous phenomenon. Yeah, right. that, the, the, in other words, you could have this feeling if you were a German at a certain time and place at a Nuremberg rally. Absolutely. It's a very dangerous phenomenon. So what we're, what we're interested in is focusing on the idea that that phenomenon highlights a notion of receptivity that stands in contrast to the notion of autom autonomy and sub uh, subjective force of will that's at the center of our understanding of ourselves now. But we want to recognize that it's a very dangerous phenomenon and you need to develop some sort of skill for being able to distinguish between those situations in which it's appropriate to allow yourself to be drawn up uh, by, by the response of the crowd and those situations in which it's not. But, but we want to insist that if you just devote yourself to avoiding all of those situations, then something important will be lost because... You mean all the situations such as going to the Super Bowl? Yeah, all the situations in which you find yourself sort of sensitive to and responding to what the crowd takes to be some great event. Yeah, not just the Super Bowl, but Martin Luther exactly. King. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, right. Or the right. Lou Gehrig farewell. You yeah, make yeah exactly. Yeah. There, there, are, there are situations in which if you turned your back on them, something would really be lost. If 200,000 people on the National Mall turned their back on Martin Luther King, when he was giving his great I have a dream speech, say, uh, and walked away, then something important in the culture would have been lost. So we think there, are, there is a tendency for people to look at this notion of whooshing and saying, it's dangerous. You really have to avoid it. If you ever found yourself in a situation where you were being drawn up into the crowd that way, you ought to get out <laughs> because it's because it could be a Nuremberg rally kind of situation. What we think is, well, yeah, but it could be a Martin Luther King situation too. And if you avoid all of them, then the culture will be poorer for it. What you really need to do <laughs> is to develop a skill for distinguishing between the ones that are worth allowing yourself to be drawn up into and the ones that are worth walking away from. In fact. So, so I, I, what I hear you saying in the book and here is uh, uh, another element of why we have to go back uh, in and look at the, the classical tradition in the great works is that we're not just retaining the sense of the sacred but also a sense of the values that we have come to that would be a guide in addition to the particular craft that you might adapt. So, so it's, a, it's the interface between those two that will keep us from the Nuremberg rallies. 
something like that, although I don't know exactly what role the values are playing. Yeah. If they, it, it's, it, it's a very, very difficult question. I think what we think, although I don't, I'm not sure we're all that clear on it, I think what we think is that if value, if you substitute for value the notion of a universal and uh, context-free principle, um, then that's not going to do it. Then that's going to be the kind of thing that closes you off to sit meanings in a situation that are worth being sensitive to rather than uh, uh, in order to get rid of a certain kind of risk. What we think is that there aren't, probably aren't going to be these universal context-free principles, but that doesn't mean that there's not going to be a distinction between the situations that are worth allowing yourself to be drawn into and the situations that aren't. It's just that that distinction isn't going to come from some, some context-free principle. It's going to come from a kind of sensitivity that you develop through skill. One of the things that struck me about your book as I read it was that we went uh, west, so to speak, backward and west to, to find this tradition, but, but, but you wound up in the east. Uh, and by that I mean that what your discussion of craftsmanship and, and the whole relationship to a craft, it reminded me of a book, I Knew the Zen of Archery. So is that, is that fair that, that, in other words, although you don't talk about it, that, that in, in a sense you've wound up there in part? Uh, uh, we, I'll say one thing, but I want to let Bert, I want to hear what Bert has to say about this too. I just gave a bunch of talks in China a couple months ago, and a number of people did say that they found similarities between the kinds of things that I was talking about in this context, <coughs> and a particular uh, Chinese philosopher named Chuang Tzu, uh, whom I don't know very well, but they uh, insisted that Heidegger, who's a philosopher who we're both very interested in, <coughs> was also very interested in Chuang Tzu. I don't, I don't know much about this, but you have yeah. things to say about Buddhism, I know. Or... Yeah, I have a feeling that though it looks very much like something we're doing, if we could read the classics in there <coughs> and get in sync with the mood, there, what God is showing up for them, get a tune, we, it would look a lot not so similar, mm -hmm. that there are these epics are pretty well unique and, and different. But it would have some big similarity, namely receptivity was certainly going to be crucial, but it's another, probably another mode of receptivity. Well, on that note, uh, I think we've, we've given uh, our audience a taste of your book. They're going to want to go out and buy it. I will show it again to them, all things uh, shining, and, and I want to thank uh, Sean and Bert for, for being here today. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.